So I think um, I'd like to get started if uh, everybody is ready. Um, my name is Joanna Nelson Boynton, class of 88. Some of you know me as Jojo. I'm president of the uh, Harvard Varsity Club. And uh, this is a terrific honor and privilege to be um, introducing this evening. Um, we have been having lots of conversations in the recent weeks um, to, to begin a conversation. And as, as the title suggests, uh, race, sport, and Harvard, active steps and conversations um, toward change. Um, we hope that this will be a beginning of a series of conversations. Um, and we really appreciate um, all of you joining us. And we appreciate the staff of the Harvard Varsity Club tonight helping us host this. Um, and I will introduce our moderator and then you will get to hear lots about um, the wonderful people on the panel who've um, been willing to join us in this um, journey. And I, I'm so appreciative. And, and Teresa Moore, uh, class of 1986, is our, our moderator tonight. She and I were in college at the same time. She's a teeny bit older. <laughs> but she is an uh, uh, Ivy League 100 meter uh, champion in her track and field days. Um, but more importantly, she's been in the business of um, sports marketing and her uh, own started her own media production company um, called Tea Time Productions um, and has has been in the field of um, focusing on issues of race and sport um, long before any of this um, conversation began uh, here officially. So we're really lucky to have her. Um, and Teresa will um, take over. And um, I really look forward to the conversation and I appreciate all the people who've joined us tonight. It's, it's an exciting start to a, a wonderful um, journey through this topic. Well, thank you, Jojo. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and I wanna welcome everyone and thank you for participating and joining us this evening in what is a series of critical discussions. Um, I think the one thing that we've stressed is that a key goal for our work in this area is that it's not just discussions, but it actually turns itself into actions uh, moving forward. So I'm very excited to be joined by these uh, four amazing panelists and I'm going to give some brief introductions. So bear with me as I read so I don't, you know, in any way mess it up. So we've got Tracy Green, who has completed 13 seasons as the Sheila Kelly Palangian head coach for Harvard women's tennis and has led the Crimson to two Ivy League championships. She currently serves on the USTA Collegiate Pathway National Committee, on the board of the Black Women in Sport Foundation, on the USPTA Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and as the outgoing board chair of the Sportsman's Tennis and Enrichment Center. So welcome, Tracy. Uh, we've got Chris Eggie, who class of 18, who captained the men's basketball team to an Ivy League championship in 2018 and that same year became the first varsity athlete in recent memory to be selected as the undergraduate student orator at Harvard commencement. He is also the founder of No More Names, a youth-led fundraising and awareness building organization created to combat criminal injustice, police brutality, and to empower youth to vote. So welcome, Chris. Uh, we've got Joseph Johnson, also of class of 18, who was a two-time captain of the Harvard wrestling team, a three-time NCAA championships qualifier, and a three-time academic All-American. As an undergraduate, he served as, the consent, as a consent advocate and relationship educator, helping to address campus rape culture and building a safer community for students by educating peers on fostering, health, fostering healthier relationships. So welcome, Joseph. And then last but no way least, um, Ghazi Musa, who is class of 19. She won five Ivy League championships as a sprinter and captained the women's track and field team in 2018, 2019. She's the founder of Aesthetics and Athletics, a platform and podcast to empower and inspire the athlete in every woman and is co-president of the Seattle chapter of the Alumni Network for Harvard Women. So welcome Ghazi. And welcome to all of our panelists. I'm extremely excited to have you here. Uh, for everyone listening, the format is that we are going to engage with our um, panelists for approximately 45 minutes and then have a Q&A session where you can submit your questions. So I wanna start out just asking the panel kind of from the 30,000 foot view that we've seen sports leaders and athletes be at the forefront of some of these recent discussions regarding race, 
systemic racism um, and, and police injustices. So what role do you think sports does or can play in starting to address some of these issues? So maybe we'll start with Tracy and go from there. Well, first, I want to say thank you to the Varsity Club for, for putting this event on. It's conversations like these that we need. So hopefully we can keep these going. Um, and to our panelists up here, our, our young folks, um, it's, been, it's been fun to, to watch you from afar and, and kind of see you blossom. Obviously, I wasn't your coach, but it, you know, obviously, you know, everybody lives vicariously through everyone. So um, congratulations on your, on your careers as well. Uh, and thank you, thank you, Teresa. Um, to answer that question, I absolutely believe uh, athletes should get involved, be able to speak up, um, you know, state their opinions. I think too many folks put athletes on a pedestal, put coaches on a pedestal. Um, too many times we, we see celebrity as a time we have to be a politician, um, you, know, you know, too much, um, especially when it comes down to uh, human rights issues. And that's what we have right now. Um, I think about a sport like tennis, and tennis is obviously a very white sport. Uh, and I think back to folks who played tennis before me, like Arthur Ashe, Althea Gibson, I just, I look at it in amazement of all the things they did to break through barriers um, and just to kind of combat racism every single day. And it makes me, makes me feel like, wait, what am I doing? What am I even doing right now uh, to, 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 to further this cause? It makes me feel, you know, minute in a sense. Um, but I am so um, hopeful and, and amazed about you know, with all the things that are going on right now. And I'm really hoping um, this conversation, this conversation keep, can keep going and uh, we can really move the ball forward in terms of act, actually making real change. Okay, thanks, uh, Tracy. Chris? Yeah, no, uh, thanks Tracy for everything you just said. I think that, that really hits it on the nose. Um, two other things that I kind of think about when I think about athletes and sports and the impact they can have with respect to race. The first being, the, the, just the visibility of professional sports, collegiate sports, and the attention that the athletes garner, you know, offers them the opportunity to create moments in themselves where we're able to kind of spark these dialogues. So, for example, when you think back to uh, Colin Kaepernick and him taking a kneel and kind of how that sparked the whole kind of rush of athlete activism, young people becoming more aware of the issue that dialogue being apparent on television and kind of permeating culture. Um, and that was sparked just by an NFL player, you know, kneeling during, during the anthem. Like, it's not like he gave a great big speech or, you know, he did anything extremely crazy, but um, because of the visibility and the way we put ath athletics and sports kind of on a pedestal, as Tracy said, um, it offered him an opportunity to create a moment in itself. Um, which I think is extremely powerful. And then the second is sports as, as community and the ability that you know, sports offers to have conversations like this. Um, one thing, you know, a big credit to my coach at Harvard, Tommy Amaker, we, we, we had a, you know, he would give us articles in the locker room. He'd leave it, at, you know, he'd leave it in our locker on top of our shoes when we, when we came back, when we came in for practice. And, you know, we, we would read and, uh, um, about different issues and, you know, we, we had the opportunity to meet Dr. Harry Edwards, but through that kind of communal opportunity of being athletes, myself, you know, someone who, you know, has lived these issues firsthand, but also my white teammates who may not have experienced it, where we were able to engage in the dialogue because we kind of had that communal aspect of brotherhood and teamwork that was pre-existing. And it allowed, to, it allowed us to kind of facilitate those discussions across uh, boundaries, whereas they might not have happened before. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Ghazi, you want to share your perspective? Yeah, I think Chris made a great point just about community and how that's also important. And I think a quote from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said that sports could be our only hope for true dialogue on these issues um, because in sports we're able to unite regardless of race, regardless of Diver of like how you look regardless of what your like sport you're playing like if you all play the same sport you're able to unite on the fact that you're playing that sport and I think it becomes almost this great equalizer that allows people to break down that barrier of oh we look different 
but then have this unifying idea and concept that we're playing the same sport. We're out here all working hard on the same sport. And so this is a space where we found this equalizer and now let's also look at our differences and be able to reconcile with that and reckon with that um, and use that for good. Okay, and then Joseph, your, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would definitely echo everything that's been said. Um, you know, for me personally, one of the things that stick out the most um, in my experience in wrestling is just that communal aspect of things. Um, specific to wrestling, like the heart of the sport is in Iowa. Um, Pennsylvania is also one of the most competitive states. Um, it's, a, it's just a very rural sport. Um, and, you know, for me, a lot of the, the teams and communities that I interacted with, you know, I was often, you know, one of the only black peers that people were probably dealing with. Um, and just the, the purity and humanity involved in sports, I think, you know, offers an opportunity to, you know, bridge certain gaps in, in ways that people often aren't able to. Um, you know, when you think about all the institutions that people have the opportunities to um, engage with on a daily basis, like whether it's your school or clubs that you join, it's often going to be people that look like you, especially in more segregated parts of the country. So um, I think athletics is a wonderful opportunity to bridge those gaps. Um, and I guess parallel to that point, um, Chris kind of alluded to this as well, is just the emphasis on character development that's so central to effective coaching. Um, I think, you know, reflecting on all of our experiences as athletes, the best coaches that we've had, you know, are focused um, not only on our success on the mat or the court or the track, but also, you know, our, our success is, you know, developing into strong adults, men and women. Um, and I think, you know, that orientation of things just provides a pretty powerful avenue for, um, you know, having these difficult conversations because you're, you're definitely, you're not doing your job in uh, building a better person if, you know, social justice is not one of your priorities. Okay. Um, and, and I think that that's all very helpful too, but the reality is that sports is also a microcosm of society so that the same issues regarding race and racism that are present in society are present and some would say prevalent in the world of sports as you look at ownership or things of that nature. So can you share maybe some of your personal experiences as a black student athlete or a black coach at Harvard, both positive and negative? Uh, you want to start with uh, Joseph? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I already kind of talked about the demographics of wrestling. Um, you know, at Harvard, my sophomore through senior year, I was the only black wrestler on the team. And a lot of Division One programs look, you know, pretty much the same um, in terms of racial diversity. And... Um, you know, some of the opportunities that I think that brings, um, you know, in terms of educating people, um, you know, I, I alluded to before, but on the negative side of things, um, you know, I think framing things as a microcosm of broader society is, is a great way to put it because, um, you know, one of the bigger narratives that you hear in the NFL, as an example, is, uh, you know, some of the narratives that develop around black quarterbacks. You often hear that they're super talented and, you know, they don't have, they're not as uh, technical and, you know, they may not have a good arm. Um, and ultimately they just rely on their athletic ability to succeed. And I think that's a narrative that unfortunately, you know, due to the lack of diversity in wrestling is pretty um, commonplace around black wrestlers. Um, you know, it's, if, if you're going up against, or one of your teammates is wrestling a black wrestler and you know nothing about them, they haven't seen any tape on them. Um, it's not uncommon to hear people already make assumptions around how they either A, don't have a, a gas tank, like they um, don't have the endurance to last, like B, they're not a technical wrestler. And as long as you can hang with them and their athletic ability and out uh, technique them, you're gonna beat them uh, without knowing anything about these wrestlers. Um, you know, that's a pretty common narrative that I see that I think is just, you know, obviously a result of a lack of education and a lack of representation. Uh, and something that's like bothered me throughout my career. Um, and I don't want to go on too long, but 
outside of the wrestling room, one thing at Harvard that I think um, Gazi and Chris can probably speak to as well is um, just perceptions around your identity. Um, a lot of people, you know, when they see a black student on Harvard's campus, like no matter how well-meaning they are, um, ultimately, you know, need to find some sort of justification for why, you know, they're a student there. And their first assumption often tends to be, oh, you're an athlete. And, you know, luckily for them, in those interactions with me, I turn out to actually be an athlete. Um, but, you know, if you talk to my non-athlete peers who are Black on campus, it's a, it's a very similar uh, situation. I, I guess Chris is, you know, almost seven feet tall, so <laughs> that might also be a fair assumption for him. But if you talk to the non-athlete Black students, it's, it's a very common thing. Um, and I think there are just a lot of assumptions that people cast on you. Um, you know, when you're a black student, but then on top of that, when you're a black student who's also an athlete, um, that, you know, you would almost, you'd be shocked that those sort of stereotypes carry on into Harvard Square, but unfortunately, they're, they're pretty common even in, you know, 2018. Yeah, and, and Joseph, two things you said that were really interesting because they carry on afterwards too, because I, I remember encounters where I said I went to Harvard and everyone was like, oh, you went to Howard. And I'm like, Howard's a wonderful school, but I'm like, no, I went to Harvard. And then somehow athletics would come up and they'd be like, oh, right. Like, like that was the only way that you could get into it, right? And then your comment about the NFL, um, we had done a documentary about that and it was kind of the thinking man positions of quarterback and center and some others for the longest time had no blacks in them because it was all assumed that they didn't have the intellectual capabilities, right? And so then you get, you know, Doug Williams, you know, blowing that up by winning the Super Bowl, but still having that narrative play itself out. So um, Chris, you know, Joseph mentioned, you know, you, kind of your experiences in being, you know, almost seven feet tall. So, so what is, what are some of your experiences? Yeah, and I thought Joseph mentioned a point that uh, I thought was really interesting of, of the idea of kind of the, the interest sectionality of being, you know, both black and a student athlete at Harvard. And, and one way I think that really does come into play um, is kind of, I, I know you hear about imposter syndrome a lot and the idea that, you know, you coming in, coming to Harvard, you hear Harvard's the best for the best of the best. And then as being a black student where people might, you know, people have conversations around affirmative action, maybe you don't deserve to be here and stuff like that. People have, I remember actually during visit toss during my pre-frosh year, I was on the bus um, heading into Boston, I think, and someone meant, and, and you know, someone saw my, myself, and I was with a kind of a diverse crew of folks, and they said this is the affirmative action bus. So that kind of plays into this idea of okay, do I do, do I deserve to be here? And you start to have kind of questions of self doubt, and then you you add on to that the fact that you're a student athlete, and you know the perceptions that people might have about student athletes on campus again about you know your academic prowess and. I thought that, you know, at least early on in my career, um, that was a little bit damaging and actually took like quite a bit of reinforcement from, you know, I had a great support system um, to actually believe that not only did I belong at Harvard, but I could excel academically because I thought that, you know, a lot of my peers I felt perceived me as, you know, just that student athlete or just that, you know, kid who, who might who might not deserve to be here. And it's And even though you're aware of, you know, your talents and, everything else, you know, you, those questions will arise and uncertainty, you know, starts to creep in. So I thought that was a great point that Joe made. And then, you know, just uh, to offer a point on the flip side of something that positive from being a student athlete at Harvard, I would say that, you know, some of my best, uh, a lot of my awakening, honestly, in terms of learning more about these issues came, came from discussions with, you know, my teammates, came from discussions in the locker room. I remember the, you know, the first major protest I attended, I attended with one of my teammates as we were walking outside of practice and people were, I think, marching down Mass Ave and we, you know, we were, we were trying to get to the dining hall, but we, we were just kind of overcome by just people kept on going. We said, we, we have to join in. And um, that experience was really awakening for me and really emboldened me. And, you know, I think played a key role in, you know, some of the stuff I'm doing now and uh, some of the stuff I did throughout my college career, because that was my freshman year that happened. So. Um, again, going back to the idea of community and having people that, you know, you, you go to war with on the field or on the court and you can kind of go through, you know, have this more uh, intangible war of dealing with these societal issues and complex dialogues that, you know, as a young, as a young, you know, at the time I was 17 year old man, 
um, you know, in search of his identity. I think, you know, going through that with other people who you have a shared identity as sports really helped. Okay. Ghazi, any, uh, anything that you want to add? Yeah, I think Chris and Joe really hit on this self-fulfilling prophecy idea and this concept that we lie at a double intersection. And for me personally, it's like a triple intersection of being a woman, but also being black, but also being a student athlete and just the pressures that you can feel there. Cause even I remember coming in freshman year um, from high school, someone said, oh, you'll get into Harvard because you're black or, oh, you'll get into Harvard because you're an athlete. And it was this almost pressure of, oh, I need to excel academically and athletically and in every way because I need to prove that stereotype wrong. And I think that comes with a lot of pressure than Black athletes, Black student athletes put on themselves to exceed this self-fulfilling prophecy that we feel is placed upon us. Um, and I think another thing that is really interesting that I think Chris and Joe also hit on was um, just this intersection, like sports in itself, like your specific sport. Because I can say for track and field, yes, um, it is a diverse sport in the sense that we have people of all backgrounds, people of all shapes and sizes um, are part of the team. But I think there's this concept and the stereotype that black women are sprinters and that white women are distance runners. And I think even within a sport where it's so diverse and you have people from all backgrounds coming together, you still at some levels have to do the work to integrate um, people on a team. Because if you've grown up, like growing up a sprinter, if I've always been around other black sprinters and having a white sprinter on my team is a great aspect and shows a different perspective. But when it's like you only see or specifically see white women that run uh, distance and then black women that sprint, then that's the automatic stereotype that a lot of people think of. And if I was to say a distance runner, it would be a, probably a shock to a lot of people that I was a black woman and I was a distance runner. So I think there are a lot of stereotypes, even within diverse sports that come into play. Yeah, no, and that's an excellent point because you always see it when you see like the men's track and field events and the white sprinter walks up to the line and everybody's like, what just happened, you know, and the, and the guy from the Ducks that actually won and everyone was like, okay, everybody hold the phone, right? So um, very interesting. Tracy, you have a different lens as a coach. So what, what are your experiences or what do you see both with the students and student athletes that you're helping coach, but also your interactions with other coaches? Right. You know, it's funny um, what, what Ghazi just said. I get, am I the track coach like all the time? Um, so I think all this sort of carries over. Um, you know, I'm listening to Chris speak about, you know, people you go to war with and, and tennis. And I know, you know, Joseph, you, know, you, you, you participated in an individual sport as well. Um, it's very combative. It's like you against someone else nonstop. So you really didn't have anybody to really go to war with before college. So really college for athletes it's really, it's really the first time they're actually playing uh, and competing on a team. So it's a whole new experience for a lot of them um, because they pretty much play at an, at an elite level. Um, but tennis is just, in my opinion, it's just so isolating. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that, that constant day in and day out, you know, you against somebody else. So it's really, we got to really just break down these barriers so just to make sure we're all kind of on the same team. Uh, growing up, you know, even just, you know, coming from Philadelphia, a pretty diverse um, city. I, I pretty much live in a predominantly white neighborhood. I went to a, uh, a K through 12 private school, uh, played tennis, obviously, but still felt so isolated in that sport, still felt all the, the pressure behind it because there weren't that many people who looked like me, you know, playing tennis. And the further you got um, level wise as a tennis player um, and coaching as well, but tennis, you, you play sectionally, you know, locally, right? You play uh, nationally. You play internationally, and there's no one who looks like you or who can, who can kind of go through the same things that you go through. Um, and it's just different, right? You make amazing friends along the way, uh, but things are just different. Um, and I've always sort of um, sort of envied uh, some other sports where you, you might come across some, some folks who, who, who look like you a little, a little more frequently. Um, and, and obviously in the coaching world, they're not obviously, but in case some folks don't know, there really aren't that many um, black women coaches at all um, in Division One in, in general, so that can be pretty isolating as well. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, you know folks are really uh, taking all these all this data to heart um, and, and trying to make some some changes. Um, you know, but as far as uh, individual instances, uh, it's interesting. I mean, you, you could be on a plane 
with your whole team there and they're saying, hey, coach, coach, do you think, coach, coach. And someone says, hey, where's your, where's your coach? And they're, they're talking to me. Like I they just they literally heard our team call me coach. And they're asking me, who's the coach? I said, yeah, I'm the coach. Oh, wait, wait, you're the coach? And I said, yes, I'm the coach. Well, you're the head coach? Yes. Okay, but where's, where's the other head coach? No, I, I'm the head coach. So it's like this whole, you know, perception thing, right? Uh, that, that you go through pretty frequently. Our team like cracks up sometimes um, uh, when, when that happens. Uh, I also heard support systems uh, mentioned uh, in, in this conversation. That's huge. I think whenever you, you know, um, take a job, um, I think it's important to try to build relationships as much as you can. Hopefully, you know, your, uh, you know, your company or your school uh, has, has tried to do, make steps um, to, to help you create those and give you some supports. And if you can't, maybe you have to build them outside of your workplace. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I, I did pretty, pretty early. I, I got involved with the Sportsman's Tennis and Enrichment Center um, and, and, and kind of worked my way up uh, you know, on the board over there. They, they were located in Dorchester. So that was a, a good way to, for me to, a way for me to kind of connect with the, with the local community and, um, and, and really uh, feel like I was you know, doing some important work. Not that, not that the work we do now is not that important, but it, it allowed me to connect. Uh, to, to some folks. So that can go on and on, but um, those, those are a few things. I think, you know, the support systems and just obviously the, the you know, the bias that takes place all the time. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because you and Joseph both mentioned kind of how it's almost, it seems like exacerbated a little bit when you're on a team that might have less diversity, but then Gaza easily pointed out that even within teams that are technically more diverse, you can still have a lack of diversity or assumptions or stereotypes, right? So um, Joseph, has there, you know, is there ever been a situation or are there situations, you know, because part of the conversation around this is that we have what are, you know, people who want to be white allies, right? And so many of the comments that came in for this event were that people feel like, you know, white people want to step up, but they don't know how, right? So what would be some of your guidance or what have been your experiences of people stepping up because you've talked about the communities you have so it could be a coach it could be a teammate it could be someone in administration but what would be either your experience or your guidance to white people who are saying i want to step in and help with some of these situations but i don't know what to say or what to do and i'll start with you joseph yeah i think um you know coming from a, a team where, you know, at, at best you're supported by allies um, and you, you don't have that built in uh, support network that, that looks like you. Um, I've reflected a ton on what that experience um, felt like, you know, particularly over the past couple of months. Um, and I've had a lot of difficult conversations actually with teammates um, and, and coaches of the past. Um, having, you know, navigated through these, um, you know, largely white spaces. And, you know, when I reflect on some of the more critical moments, um, you know, I think they're moments that look like this one, um, you know, in the midst of a national tragedy that, um, you know, just has a certain severity of, of pain in, across the Black community. Um, and, you know, particularly with the, with the George Floyd case, like, you know, that's something that you, you see that video and it's impossible to assume that everything's going to be okay in the black community and everything, all of your black peers are, you know, going to wake up and feel the same way that they did yesterday. Um, and a moment that paralleled that in college for me that, you know, has stuck with me, and, um, affected me pretty dramatically, I'd say, was probably the summer of 2016, um, where you had the murders of both Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. And, you know, that was a very similar moment in that, you know, you didn't have to be very attuned to, uh, you didn't have to be very attuned to the, the struggle for racial, racial justice to know that, you know, that's going to be a moment that hurts the Black community, it hurts your, your Black teammate or Black friend or roommate. Um, and, you know, I, I just recall struggling, you know, seriously that summer. It was like one of the darkest periods of my life, just reflecting on, um, you know, race relations in America and the implications of something like that on, on myself. You know, it's a moment where, you know, you're reminded no matter how much privilege you accumulate, you know, 
the color of your skin can be a determinant of, of outcomes like that. And uh, I struggled a lot. And at the time, um, you know, I was, I was living with two guys who were teammates, like, you know, people that I was very close with um, that summer. And I don't mean to call them out, <laughs> like this isn't an attack on them, but I think it just, you know, speaks to what good allyship can be. Uh, and it's just like a moment where like you, you turn on the news, like you're getting iPhone alerts about what's happening. And I think the first step of, of being an ally is just applying the empathy that you apply, you know, in every other facet of life. Like, you know, if midterm season comes around and I'm really struggling and I look like I'm going through it, you're probably going to, you know, say something because you know that there's a stressor. Um, but if you see that happening and, you know, it's probably being caused by, um, you know, broader issues around race relations, like, I think that's a moment where, you know, as, as a friend, as a teammate, as someone who should be able to empathize with me personally and easily, like that's a time where you have to step up and it doesn't mean that you have to be waving the flag and be an example of, you know, what perfect allyship looks like. But I think that's where you rely upon your capacity for empathy for someone that you've been in the trenches with, like you've gone to war with um, and, and you've struggled with and like you, you need to identify with the pain that they're going through and initiate that conversation. Because it's very easy to say, well, why didn't you, why are you not the one initiating that conversation yourself? But it's important, you know, for our allies to understand that, you know, these are, these aren't just like frustrating moments. Like these are deeply painful, traumatic moments, you know, that, that the black community is experiencing real, real time. So it's not always easy for us to be the, the one starting the conversation when I don't even, I don't know how you're going to respond. Like, I don't know where you stand. Um, because you have made it clear to me. So I think, you know, that receptivity and just applying the empathy that, you know, you expect your friends and, and colleagues and close individuals to apply in other scenarios, you know, to those that relate to, to race, because sometimes it's obvious, you know, um, it unfortunately doesn't get more obvious than the murder of George Floyd, which, you know, is the reason why we're having this conversation right now. But, you know, a part of being a good friend, I think, is you know, just being attuned to those things and, um, you know, caring about people the way that you care about them and, and other elements of their life as a, as a good teammate or as a good friend. Okay, no, thankful. And I, and I thank you. Thank you. And I think you hit on a good point, too. Like, sometimes you're just processing the stuff that's happening. So trying to process it and also initiate a, t a conversation is sometimes challenging, right? So, um, Ghazi, you want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say something around the aspect of recruiting and how in order to be an ally in that space, there needs to be a diversity of recruiting. And um, looking back on the Women's Sports Foundation, they were talking about the this equity project and how personally I on the track team um, was on a predominantly, in the sprint group, I was on a predominantly black squad of people. Um, but the numbers in terms of the NCAA are staggering when at like 21% of all female division one student athletes are black and 56 percent of all division one female student athletes are white and the sports that have like very uh few black athletes are softball volleyball soccer and swimming and lacrosse and just looking at those numbers i ha it was a shock to me because being a black athlete or being a black student athlete and being on a team in a sport that's very diverse i don't necessarily i didn't realize how stark that was and i think it comes down to like when younger black women can see older black women in the NCAA at Harvard in these sports playing those sports, then they can start to believe and continue that dream and journey of being an, an athlete in that sport, so whether it's volleyball, whether it's softball, or whether it's swimming. If they see representation, they'll be more inclined to continue with that sport and want to do that sport. So I think it's being an ally in that respect from like a recruiting standpoint. But then I also think it's like knowing that possibly like my team, like a team isn't diverse, um, looking at, okay, what is our anti-racism um, curriculum? What is our orientation around these things? How can we start this discussion? How can we continue the discussion? And how are we allowing this to be something that's part of our culture and a part of what we talk about and what we care about? Um, so I think it's like, whether your team is 
predominantly white, whether your team is um, of mixed race, like it's having the discussions and creating curriculum and having an orientation around it. Because I think that's how we begin to have the conversation and create change. Uh, Tracy, do you have any thoughts on it? No, I, I completely agree with what Ghazi said there. I mean, I think Harvard is in a unique place um, as, as leaders, right? I think they've done a lot so far, but there's a long way to go uh, in, in all these areas. Um, and obviously numbers don't lie, right? So the, the more we can create programs and systems um, that can really help um, you know, folks reach a broader uh, group of people, um, I, think, I think the better. Um, we, we, also, um, we also probably need to start, start, some, start some affinity groups, right? Uh, what, what's wrong with having a, a black uh, student athlete group? I'm, I'm just naming it that, but what's wrong with that? Why not? You know, I know some people, there were some rumblings about it uh, last year, and we have a new AD, so, so, so we'll, we'll see where, where some things go. Uh, but, but I think the possibilities are endless right now. There's a lot of energy out there. I know my team is pumped up. I know a lot of teams out there at Harvard pumped up. I know guys in the track team, you guys are doing a whole lot of things that I've been following on, on social media. Um, it's great to see. Again, I'm so hopeful. Um, but there's a long way to go. And when I say a long way to go, I mean, there's a long way to go. So this, this, this you know, conversation right now is the first step. Um, and, and it can be, it can, it can feel tiring to folks like, oh, we're talking about this again and again and again, but, but it's the reality for so many people, right? So we, we can't, we can't um, forget that it's going take, to take a long way to, to make these permanent changes. Okay, Chris, um, you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I, I had a few thoughts, and uh, one of them is actually something, uh, Joe's actually my roommate, so we talk, we talk about this every once in a while, and uh, one point that he brought up that was pretty salient was the idea of the benefit of the doubt, and it's something that I personally try to apply as I try to be an ally in, you know, different situations, whether that's, uh, you know, the LGBTQ uh, community or learning how to be an ally to women and, you know, survivors of uh, incidents of violence, but I think just the idea of giving the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes, I, I, you know, a lot of times I think the struggle is I don't know what the experience is. I've never experienced this personally. And I think you should acknowledge that that is a privilege that you have to have not experienced that. And that your job then is to acknowledge that you have a lack of knowledge. And, and when someone says something and this hurts, you don't know oh, why does it hurt? You accept that it hurts and then you work from there because you don't understand. So your job is to center the voices of the people who live those experiences and then work backwards from there rather than working from a position of oh you need to give me every answer right now because oftentimes particularly instances like with george floyd where it's such an acute pain and such an acute instance of violence that is really traumatic i i, I in the moment especially people don't have the words so you, you have to take me at the words i do have or at the thoughts i do have and uh and meet me there rather than me having to me needing proof to show you that racism exists or me needing proof to show you that I'm hurting or that harm has been done. And then with that, I think uh, the next step I think is really important is just ask, start asking questions um, and really interrogating your life and starting at home is whether that's, um, you know, if you're on a team that's less diverse and asking, okay, why are we less diverse? And it's like, oh, because, oh, we were, you know, for example, at work, it might be, you know, because we don't recruit, uh, you know, uh, we don't recruit people from, you know, certain schools. It's like, okay, why not? And just really getting down to the roots of that things and then doing the reading to back it up, you know, and understanding that maybe, oh, maybe the pools that we recruit from aren't as diverse already because of these institutional problems and then getting to the root of things. But I think that starts with just asking the right questions. Um, the way you would, I think you would approach it, you know, if you're trying to solve a, you know, a problem at, at your workplace, you know, you start asking questions and you start, um, you start moving. And I think that that leads into the last point of just showing up every day, I think it, it is a big part of what it means to be an ally. I think, you know, um, people always talk, my, my mom has a quote that, you know, she never got to take a day off being my mom. Mm -hmm. And um, whether, you know, whether she was tired or not, she, she, you know, she made dinner when I was a kid and, you know, couldn't feed myself, you know? So I think that's part of what, what being an ally is. You, you don't get you don't get to pick and choose which days you show up. You know, uh, George Floyd was killed, but uh, I don't know if I want to support you know the movement for Brianna because this is this is my stance there. 
I think, again, give the benefit of the doubt and just continue to show up day after day, week after week, and um, center the voices of people who, who, are, who are leading the way. Okay. And I think that, you know, that's an interesting point, too, because this idea of showing up, because it applies not only to white allies, but also Blacks showing up for other Blacks, right? And so, you know, I, I think about, uh, and I think one of the readings, the author talked about not stepping up you know, to some situations. And I actually reflect on something that happened when I was a freshman, right? And, and we did the Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge meet where you go, you know, you compete and then you're a teammate with the Harvard, with the Yale team to go over and compete in Europe. And so there was a black woman runner on the Yale team who in essence was my teammate, but I didn't really know her. I was just first meeting her and she had braids in her hair. And um, somehow a conversation started about her braids. And then someone said to me, well, what do you think? And I didn't say anything negative, but I didn't say anything really affirmative, right? Like I didn't step up to that moment and support her. And so she never said anything to me and, and we, we never discussed it. But I sit years later regretting the fact that I didn't step into that moment to be a support mechanism for her within that conversation. So what do we think is also that responsibility of other Blacks to step up and be in the moment with other people? Um, Ghazi, I see you shaking your head. What do you think? Well, I think there's a quote on the Dexter Gate that says, enter to grow in wisdom, depart to better serve thy country and thy kind. And I had to ask myself at the beginning of all this, like after I graduated from Harvard University, like what was I doing to do the second part of that? Like to better serve thy country and thy kind, specifically thy black kind. Um, and I think all of us as Harvard students, as a black Harvard student, as a black student, Harvard student athlete, we have a set of privilege, black privilege, that sometimes we don't like to talk about, but we have black privilege in the sense that we're able to look like we do and go to the school and afford the opportunities that we do have. So it, I had asked my question myself, like how am I serving those that might look like me, but aren't the same socioeconomic status or might not have the same job as me? Like what am I doing to go beyond just the people that might have gone to the same school as me? Um, so I think it's, everyone has a job to do in all of this. It's not one person or the other person or a specific race. Like we all have to do the work in the sense that like, if we don't all do the work, like we're gonna be running two separate paths like this and we'll never come together and work it out. Like we all have to meet each other halfway in some ways and choose to choose people. Like it's not about parties, it's not about sides, it's not about this or that, it's about choosing people and putting people first and treating people like you want to be treated. So I think that comes down to the, we all have work to do. I was muted, sorry about that. <laughs> Tracy, would you like to add on to that? I mean, support comes in, in, in so many forms, right? So it could be in, like one person supporting another person. You know, it looks looks so different, right, all the time. Um, but it usually starts with, with, with the thought. So if you keep that thought in your mind, like how can I help someone else? How can I be kind today? Just, just break it down to the, the minimal steps. I think that's that goes a long way. Um, acknowledging one another, you know, you know the, every day is tough. Obviously, being a student at Harvard, you all know, is super tough, you know. Um, you know so just, just taking a break and just saying, hey, how can I help someone else today? How can I lift someone else up? And that's been something that, for me as a coach, um, you know, talking about other, other coaches, other people who have tried to mentor, um, who've mentored me, it's been totally, uh, you know, a huge part of my life. I wouldn't be where I am today without somebody, you know, reaching back to help me, um, me trying to help others so that's something we, we definitely need and the more we can just think about that on a daily basis um, as students right people who recently graduated uh, the whole nine yards I think the better the better off will be it's, it's tough because you gotta you know get away from the me for a minute and think about the we uh, but it's something we need to do more of for sure okay Chris and you want to add yeah, and I, I, you know, I just uh, like to, you know, hop on that last one of it. It, it, it isn't always easy, but um, I think things are worth it, never are. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the one other thought I, I would add is um, sometimes the hardest part is just getting started. Um, so start somewhere, you know, 
don't don't get caught up in the idea of paralysis as I don't know what to do. I start start with an article, start with a conversation, but start. Okay. Joseph, any uh, any added comments on that? Yeah, real quick. I mean, I think just on that last point of getting started, a lot of this um, really benefits just from education. Um, going into Harvard, you know, one of my big goals was just developing a stronger knowledge of, of self. And, um, you know, I think just being equipped with the appropriate education, you know, particularly from a historical context, um, can be really empowering as, as a way to start and just understand, you know, how you fit in, into the puzzle um, in, in terms of making change. So, I mean, globally, everyone benefits from that component of things. But um, there's just definitely something special when it um, manifests in terms of like knowledge of self and, and understanding who you are. Okay, and I and I think each of you has kind of hit on some ideas, whether it's uh, internal or external to Harvard, about as people are leaving this discussion, what can be some things that they think about that they can do personally, you know, as a team, as athletics, as the Harvard community, both internally and externally. And I know, you know, Tracy, you talked about the affinity group and uh, Chris, you mentioned um, Coach Amaker, who I was just watching him on ESPN the other day, talking about the John McClendon initiative to create more opportunities for blacks within leadership positions in um, collegiate athletics. So what are maybe some, some thoughts, because that's part of our goal is to step away Away from these meetings with actual things that people could do. So, you know, what would your one thing, you know, maybe be to suggest to some people as to coming out of this meeting, do this? Um, Tracy, you already gave us a good one, so you can say your affinity group again, but do you want to add another one? So I think if, if you're sort of new to this arena, I would say, you know, aside from trying to create affinity groups and just groups in general, I would say really try to educate yourself uh, as much as you can on all these topics. If, if you know someone who's, who's, who's active in, the, in, the, uh, in this movement or just, or you just want to learn your history, that, that's like, that's so important. I love the, the point that you guys made about uh, creating a course, you know, uh, at, at Harvard, I think that'd be super useful for everyone. Um, but, but truly, I mean, history is so vital to understanding the steps that have taken place in the past, right? Because we, we don't remember the past, we will, what, repeat it. Um, just even, I'm just talking about tennis right now for a minute. 1990, the number four player in the world, a black woman, Zena Garrison, they would not sponsor her. She had no apparel sponsor. She was in the finals of Wimbledon, number four in the world, no sponsor. So that's, that wasn't that long ago. So yes, learn about slavery and all that, but like things that happened like not that long ago, like learn about um, what, what's going on right now. So, so it, takes, it takes effort, right? If, if you don't have an automatic, uh, you know, if you're not thinking about it day to day, if you have that privilege where you don't have to think about race or color or whatever. Um, but, but if you take the time to really make it your agenda, make it your mission to educate yourself, I think that's the very first step. Um, to, to help me to, to help me make things better. Ghazi, anything that you might want to suggest? I know you have the curricular idea, but anything else? Yeah, I think um, just like a big point is in order to make this like not just a moment, but a movement, we have to kind of diversify our movements. And I think one big thing, especially for the, in the Gen Z generation, um, everything's done on social media or everything's done publicly, but not every movement is public. Like some could be physically talking to other people in our spaces and places that might not talk about this stuff. Maybe it, it's um, like mentally, like mentally talking or looking at ourselves inwardly. Um, and I think one of the biggest things about also diversifying your movement is there's kind of three parts to it, similar to how we, how you would train and you have the prehab, you have the competition, then you have rehab. Like look at it as that, like you have to prep before you can go into battle, you have to prep before you can go into competition. So prepping yourself to make a move, make a move and make a movement is important. And then the reflection side after you make that movement of reflecting like, why did I move in this way this time? And how can I move differently? How did that help? What did it, how did it harm if it did? And how can I continue to make different movements, but in different ways? So I think that's really big. Okay, Joseph, uh, your idea? 
Yeah, um, I, I'd say institutionally, as we think about athletics, um, particularly at, at Harvard, um, one of the you know most effective things that I think that we could do is just strengthen um, strengthen the uh, infrastructure for supporting your athletes and ensuring that you know they can advocate for themselves. Um, that's a you know that's a big focal point of the athletic department broadly, like ensuring that students can run issues that they have up the chain uh, relatively easily. But um, as you think through how that looks in terms of you know racial issues, um, I think you know there obviously needs to be a bit more sensitivity around that. Um, I think that's just one sort of tangible institutional thing. Um, and then at the personal level as you do engage with education, whatever that looks like, whether it's reading articles or, um, you know, ideally participating in a Harvard led curriculum. Uh, I think one important piece of advice that I have is just put your ego to the side um, because a lot of this is challenging when, you know, for example, if, if you're being told that you've benefited from white supremacy your whole life, you know, that's, that's a difficult thing to hear um, but that doesn't mean that you yourself are a villain because of that. Um, you know, whenever we think about being an ally, and, and Chris alluded to this, you know, you know, when you're thinking about supporting the women community or the LGBTQ community, um, you know, it's important to recognize that you know you've benefited from from privilege, but that does not um, create an unconquerable barrier to being a part of the solution. Um, so I think, you know, that ego point is, is just very important as you, you know, do begin to challenge yourself and, and educate yourself. It's just something to keep in the back of your mind that, yeah, maybe I have caused harm in, in the past, but that doesn't mean that I'm incapable of um, overcoming it. Okay, and Chris? Yeah, and um, on my end, the one thing, uh, I'll speak about it from my perspective because when I, you know, um, my senior year, I looked to try and get involved more in, uh, more hands-on in a movement. I started this organization, No More Names, and the idea to, was to run a, you know, a benefit concert on campus to donate to an organization that uh, supports, uh, you know, reforms for police officers uh, and their departments to, you know, reduce incidents of police brutality. And, you know, in the time since starting that organization, I think the most important lesson I learned was really take the time to not necessarily try and think of your own solutions or try and think of, you know, um, try and, you know, create, try and lead necessarily, but understand it's okay to follow and really spend time researching who are the, the leaders of this movement. Um, Cause there are, there are people who are like the young people in Minnesota are doing great work. Um, there's young, you know, Seth Towns from our basketball team is doing great work. There's, there's young people who are, you know, already doing great work. There's people, organizations in place that are doing great work. Really understand the landscape. Take your time to familiarize yourself with those organizations. And, you know, align with one that you really think you could, you know, invest your time with. And I think um, that's one way that I, I think, uh, and even just taking that first step of finding out the landscape, I think is a great first step to, to take. Because it, it will help you, you know, beyond just action, but in future dialogues as well. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. The one thing though I did wanna do beforehand, cause a couple of you hit on it, was that, you know, all these actions don't have to be this over the top, you know, huge elaborate thing. And uh, we had a, a Dr. Richard Wharton who wrote in to us, he wasn't able to join us tonight, but he's the class of 57 and he talked about that he ran um, track and field. He was captain of the track team. He's in the Harvard Varsity Club Hall of Fame and that his senior year, um, he asked the coach, could he have all of the team over to his home in Roxbury for a celebratory meal? And so the whole team, you know, mostly white uh, fellow teammates went over and had this amazing meal prepared by his mother and his grandmother. And he said that years later and at reunions, his teammates still come up to him and just say how that was a moment in time that changed their perception because they had never entered into the home of a black family, had a meal with them. And that years later out of all of their Harvard experiences, that's the type of thing that they remember. 
So we have to also remember that sometimes it can be just the most simple of sharing a meal or doing something that reaches out and brings someone into your space that can create that moment as well. So um, I'm going to start to read to you from the Q&A board panelists. You can all decide, you know, what you want to jump in and take. So we've got uh, Ted Bailey, who says, I'm old, class of 1962 in track. I wish we had more interracial participants when I was there. I think stereotyping and bigotry is truly ignorance. How do we stop it? Education in this program is a good icebreaker. And then it says, I appreciate the panelists describing their experience. So Ted, thank you for that comment. Um, then um, another anonymous attendee just said, they hope that we can get to a point where skin color is just like hair color. How do we get there? Um, then we have one that says, when you were an undergraduate student, what would you have liked to see in regards to transparency from your school and or athletic department to feel supported in the culture of Harvard? So do any of you recent grads want to take that? Uh, and Joseph, I think you started a little bit on saying like some of the things that need to be broken down, but are there other things that you think might um, help kind of start to break down some of those, those barriers? Um, yeah, from, from a transparency perspective, I think, you know, Tracy's advice around creating an affinity group is, is powerful um, in that, you know, you're more um, equipped to deal with scenarios that are bothering you um, when there's an actual infrastructure of people that, you know, are, are going to be solid in that moment um, when, when it comes time to have a difficult conversation. Um, I think another tangible activity or action, um, you know, that Ghazi also alluded to with regard to diversity and, and recruiting is, you know, being very introspective and um, meticulous in the way that you're reflecting on recruiting techniques and, and tactics um, and, and how inclusive we're being in, in terms of the approach. Um, because it, it is easy to, you know, not be able to piece together why a team looks a certain way. Um, but if we do a better job of just tracking that um, and creating structures for accountability that are particularly committed to these uh, sort of initiatives, uh, I do think you can make a, a little bit of progress in, in that sphere. Okay. Ghazi or Chris or Tracy, do you want to add on or or we can move to the next question, whatever works for you. Yeah, I wanted to add on briefly, and I think this, this speaks to Joe's point and, uh, and to Tracy's point about the affinity group, but I also think just representation and, you know, as these dialogues happen, looping, you know, Black student athletes, um, as the school thinks about the next steps they're going to take in terms of are we going to have a, you know, are we going to have events? How are we, are we going to have education materials? Like in all those processes, have reps from different teams be involved in the creation of that. Have an active dialogue where you're meeting quarterly with black student athletes or annually or on a regular cadence where these ideas are being discussed and people are constantly coming to the table. Because those are the people who are experiencing every day. And that way you don't have to have, you know, these big kind of, you know, you, you have less big kumbaya moments where it's like, oh, there's this huge problem. Now we have to come up with big actions because you're constantly iterating and having that dialogue. But just opening that kind of two-way dialogue, I think is super important. Okay. Uh, Tracy or Ghazi, anything that you want to add? Okay. Um, so one of the questions at, wants the panel to comment on how we can ensure more interactions between black students and students of color and white students at Harvard and beyond. Uh, it says, by being on the track team, I was fortunate enough to have interactions, friendships with a diverse group, and learned greatly from this. So how do you think that that happens both on the, you know, down at the athletic field, but just as importantly, when you step back across the river, how do we look towards more of those interactions, do you think? Ghazi? I think that's a great question. And I think two things. Um, one, I think one way we could do that from an athletic standpoint is we, I th don't, I'm not sure if they still have them, but we used to have the meetings at the beginning of the year where we talked about eligibility and how, um, like we'd send those long meetings and talk about eligibility. 
But I think one way to integrate that aspect is you don't really necessarily go outside your team of where you're sitting. You don't necessarily interact with other people on different teams. And that's a great opportunity where you have three different times where you have all spring sports, all winter sports, all fall sports sitting there to have a dialogue and have a conversation and for people to meet other student athletes that might play different sports as them, might look different than them. Um, I think that would be a great place and space to do that. Um, and then on the other end, I think it's hard because it has to start with you want making the effort and wanting to. Because if you are, once we're across the river on the other side, if there's not an equal um, place where people both want to meet to people that don't look like them, don't act like them, aren't from the same socioeconomic status as them, then we're still going to be running the race like this. So it has to be kind of a commitment from everyone to be like, you know what, I'm going to diversify my movement. I'm going to diversify the people I sit with at Annenberg. I'm going to diversify the people that I talk with during section. So I think it's having a desire and a want to diversify how you interact um, that I think comes from with everyone reflecting on their own and deciding that that's the action they're going to take. Okay. And it seems like coaches could be pretty helpful with that idea you gave about having teams interact. That's, that's a great idea, guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. And Chris, I think this is for you. It said, how did the experiences that coach Amaker offered in various locations, such as Atlanta with president Carter, the MLK Center, and later at the Supreme Court, and other involvement with the Breakfast Club prepare you for the moments you're facing now? Uh, well, first, unfortunately, Coach waited till I graduated to, <laughs> to meet President Carter. And uh, so I missed out on that one. But I, I had great experiences. We got to meet, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, which was incredible, Dr. Ray Edwards. Um, every year, we, we uh, MLK Day weekend, we, we play against Howard. Um, so. Um, we could visit the memorial um, and all that. So he created, he's fostered a great ecosystem in terms of one, um, bringing in great speakers and individuals who we can kind of bounce ideas off of. I remember in particular a great dialogue we had with uh, Professor Cornell West, where we basically we have like a team dinner after practice one day, and then you know uh, we have a speaker who speaks, and then we just have like a very transparent question and answer section, and. Um, I think some of those experiences have been, you know, some of the most informative experiences as I look to build my worldview and look to, you know, contribute to these causes. Um, for, you know, for example, Dr. Harry Edwards, I still reach out to him for advice and assistance with uh, No More Names. He was one of the first donors to our first event. He contributed a video to our event. So just meeting people who are advocates and sponsors throughout the process are, are, is super great. And then Secondly, educating yourself, but then last, as I spoke about before, doing it in community makes it a lot easier because these are painful, you know, for many people, these are painful discussions to have because, you know, it might not be easy to acknowledge you have privilege. It might not be easy to acknowledge that, you know, um, you might be not just benefiting from, but contributing to a system that, you know, is harming others. And going through that process of unlearning and relearning, I think, and re-educating yourself um, with others in community, with the guidance of people who are super experienced in these fields was, was super beneficial. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in? Oh, it was just basketball. So never mind. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so the next question, it says, in the late 70s, I was the first African-Americans to start on the varsity baseball team in modern times. During that time, my teammates and uh, my teammates were supportive and close, but I experienced instances of microaggressions and profiling on campus and in the Dunster House that were very disheartening as white folks asserted privilege, assuming that you don't belong. One person asked me, did I live in Dunster House while I was washing my clothes, even though I had lived there for two years and coordinated activities in the house for black organizations for the entire community. I had to provide a teachable moment for her, even though I was very upset. I had to maintain my reason and always think about my overall goals. How have you had to do, how have any of you dealt with and confronted microaggressions? So anyone can take that one. Any examples of microaggressions or things that you've experienced? I mean, I think we talked about this, you talked about this a little bit, like this concept of Howard versus Harvard. 
Um, and I've experienced that even in the work world of someone asking, oh, like, where'd you go to school? And I say Harvard, and they're like, oh, you mean Harvard, Howard? And I'm like, no, I went to ha Harvard. Um, so I think it's those little microaggressions or even at school, whether it was I was in a class, like this concept of, oh, that being an athlete class or like a section TF saying, oh, that's an athlete class. And when you look at the multiple intersections you lie there, like you could just take that as that saying that's an athlete class. But then when you look at the demographic of the class, that's a whole nother thing. Like there are a large majority of black students in that section. Um, so I think dealing with microaggressions is hard in the sense that it takes uh, a toll for you to reflect on, okay, why did that person say that? And where can we go from here? But then also like having the courage to talk to the person about like wondering, asking, maybe it's asking the question of like, hey, just wondering like, what was your meaning behind that comment? Like, why did you, what, what, like not trying to be defensive, but trying to understand like, and get to the root of why that comment was made. And maybe that will help show that person a different perspective of, oh, you know what? I didn't realize that this comment has like, racist rhetoric rooted in it or it it hurts someone else um so i think it's taking comments like that and trying to reason with okay why is this person saying this like is it do they have a different background that they come from that they're saying this but then also looking at it like asking the question a follow-up of like okay why why would wh like what made you want to say that comment or like how um do you think that comment affects other people um in that respect yeah, and I think one of the articles actually talked about that. Like if you start to get into an argument of intent, it's never going to, because you can't really fully understand people's intent, but you can understand the impact, right? And I think, Ozzy, I think also, and this wasn't necessarily a microaggression, but we talked a little bit about it too, when you're in these situations where you feel uncomfortable. And I think we talked about it like twice where uh, during my collegiate career, I ended up at classmates' homes or alumni's homes where all the people, all the butlers and maids and everything were people of color. And just sitting there as a kid of color being served by people of color and just the level of discomfort I felt, but you're not really in a position to be judging or anything, but just, and so it wasn't a microaggression by them, but just these circumstances that you end up in and you have to figure out what is my, what should be my interaction with these people or should there be any, and just not always knowing what to do, so. Um, let's see, next question says, do you have any recommendations for candidates for the Harvard Board of Overseers and Directors who will address the concerns discussed in this excellent forum? See, panelists, it was called an excellent forum. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, and that's an interesting thing. It's kind of like what Joseph talked about is, you know, getting people into leadership, things that can affect some change. So what do we think about on that front? Chris? Yeah. I pop in quickly. Um, I know Mitch Purse, who was on the soccer team um, when I was at Harvard. You know, she I think she plays soccer professionally. She's part of a group called Harvard Forward that is uh, looking to you know address a lot of issues of social inequality on Harvard's campus, whether that be that you know divesting from prison or uh, environmental issues. Um, and she's I know she's running for the, the board of overseers as the elections right now. So as a candidate and you know you can read more about the Harvard Ford group. Um, I'm sure I think if you just Google their website, it will pull, pop up and it'll give you some information about the work that they're doing. I think that I, I'm really supportive of what they're doing. I think it's incredible. And I think you know these are dialogues that need to need to happen. And as a former student athlete, I think Midge is a, is a great uh, representative for that. Yeah. And I think this goes to the, the comments that all of you made about being informed, right? Because you, when you get the election thing, it lists all the things that people are involved in or whatever. So you need to really look in that and then choose to vote, right? Like we were talking about this for November, but election things like this have just as much impact on resources or things that are happening at Harvard. So understanding whom you're being asked to vote for and then executing you know, your suffrage rights is always key. Anyone else uh, have any comments about the, the Board of Overseers? Tracy? I don't have any comments on that, but just going back to the microaggression, this reminded me of, of something I heard once about um, microaggressions. It's almost like a bunch of paper cuts, right? But if you, if you get like a million paper cuts, that's like being stabbed with, <laughs> with a knife, right, over and over again. So you really have to stop them, you know, head on. I think the guys you made a great point about asking the question, wait, why did you ask me that? Or what did you mean by that? I think that's, that's really important. I think it, it happened a lot so much where 
sometimes you don't even realize it because you're just like in a, in a, in a zone sometimes. And, and obviously, you know, some people could be your friends, it could be your colleagues, it could be a, a fellow coach, right? Um, but I think it's important to stop uh, and have these conversations. And this is the reason why we need dialogues like this one, right? We need dialogues going on on campus um, as much as possible in the beginning of school, at the end of school, in the middle of school, all the time. So we know how to combat these issues. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and it's funny too, because you don't even sometimes realize that you are having some of those moments. Because I was just talking to a a good friend of mine, and she, she was talking about how, you know, this panel kind of made her think about this thing that happened with us where we were somewhere and a bunch of us were trying to find someone's house to go to and we got lost. And everyone was like, well, just go up to the window and peek in. And I was like, I am not as the black person going up to those windows to peek in, you know, and, and so she said at the moment or at the time she didn't understand it. But now stepping back and listening how, you know, that was something that I had to consider in all of my interactions versus something that she didn't even remotely think about, you know, or have to think about. So um, let's see, we have, um, let's see, oops, this is probably for you, Ghazi. It said, would the idea affinity group be integrated and what are the best venues to bring together, to bring people together? So Ghazi, I know. So I think um, that's an interesting point because I think there needs to be a space and a place Like we've come far, but we've not come far enough. So there needs to be a space and a place for black athletes to come together and be able to speak about the issues and things that are going on. But I do think there is space for an ally group within the infinity group of people that are willing to come and listen and come and hear and join meetings and bring knowledge back to their teams about, um, kind of what's going on. So I think it's like, it, it, there is a need for an affinity group, but also there's need for allies in themselves and a group of allies that are willing to listen and willing to really um, do the work. Okay, um, thank you. So question, are there particular organizations that you would favor sending funds to? A lot of Harvard grads have funds um, over the last several weeks and I've been donating to bail funds and also to the United Negro College Fund to support historically black colleges and universities. Are there any other funds that you might suggest or even some of your organizations, you're doing some great things. So go ahead, put it out there, ask for the, ask for the money. <laughs> but are there any groups you might recommend? Anyone? Um, one, uh, there's a few organizations I think bail funds one are, are a great are a great way to contribute, um, particularly with all the protests that are going on. Um, I'd also say um, I think a focus on you know organizations that uh, support intersectional intersectional groups within within the black uh, within the black community are particularly helpful, um, and more regional organizations rather than always national organizations because those organizations, particularly in this moment, have received a, a ton of funding, but uh, lo local um, organizations for Black youth, for Black trans folk, for Black women um, that address those issues often get can get overlooked during moments like this where like everybody, for example, the Minnesota Freedom Front was a name of an organization that really got plastered all across social media and they do great work and they're super, you know, visible, but they're just organizations. I would say um, I could give you names of national organizations that um, I, I've recommended to a bunch of people, but I think it, what it might even be more powerful is, you know, doing some work and uh, finding a local or regional organization that, you know, is a little bit more in the shadows that you can contribute to. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, something that doesn't really require you giving away money, but yes, uh, kind of reallocating a bit. Um, putting your money and saving some, putting your, some of your savings in black owned banks is a great way to contribute to uh, Black organizations, particularly Black businesses and localities. Um, you don't have to spend your money, it's, it's sitting there just as it would, but those banks then use those funds to make loans to Black businesses, to Black homeowners, et cetera, that have historically been you know, denied access by um, other financial institutions. And that, that's a huge problem within the Black community, being underbanked. And uh, you know, putting some of your savings or putting some money in those in those organizations is, is goes a long way. 
Yeah, and Chris, I think that's an excellent point because you saw it illustrated during this COVID, this PPP thing, right? Where yeah. minority businesses didn't have relationships with the Chase or the wherever, and so they didn't even get the chance to get their applications in, right? And so they had to kind of go back and kind of have some of these black banks or these community banks actually have the access so that some of those businesses could even have a chance of getting the funds. Right? Yeah, and to, and to that point, um, I just wanted to say that oftentimes people think that, you know, to be an activist is just to, you know, to march on the streets and that's one way. But I also think, you know, if you're a business person, like I said, putting money in, in banks or investing in black owned businesses, recruitment or, um, you know, uh, connection, sponsorship of young, young individuals who are interviewing, you know, I've seen many people post on LinkedIn that, you know, if you're interested in breaking into my, into my career path, reach out to me. And, you know, I'm, here's a calendar, find a slide and we can find time. And those are the just simple ways that like, you don't need a new skill set. It's just do what you already do, but offer your skill set to young people of color or people of color more broadly who have historically been denied access to resources like that. And that's one way to chip in without, um, with your time rather than, you know, always uh, just donating money. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a great example too because when we did our football film about the integration of pro football, I actually had all black women, uh, almost all black women, I had one white woman work on the project. So we had both a gender and a race thing going on. And so I know the NFL was like, what the heck, right? But it was a way to bring the narrative forward and also bring a different lens because we wanted to talk about women's role in the movement. So I think that's a great idea that you can think of ways that you can be um, providing opportunities, whether it's giving money or giving opportunity, right? Anyone else want to, uh, Tracy? Yeah, one of the organizations that's near and dear to, to my heart is the Black Women in Sport Foundation. I'm actually on the board uh, there. We, pro we provide opportunities uh, for Black women and girls and boys um, in sport, all aspects, you know, coaching, administration, you name it. Um, you know, you can even partner. So that, like Chris said, there's, there's money, there's you know, donating that way, but even partnering is, is another way um, to, to help a foundation. Um, I know some of the sports teams at Harvard have, have, have become involved and um, they're, they're really uh, strong uh, proponents of uh, non-traditional sports for African-Americans as well. So sports like fencing, golf, tennis, um, those are some of the sports where we're obviously underrepresented um, and they're really doing a, a, an amazing job at, at getting more people involved and, and having a, a voice, um, not just a seat at the table, but really being involved in the decision-making aspects as well. So again, the Black Women Sport Foundation, um, I think it's an excellent organization. Okay, great. Just, <laughs> just to second that too, um, Aesthetics and Athletics, the pl platform I'm start, I started, um, is working, so I'm running a, a, a half marathon and donating um, money to the Black Women Sports Foundation. And I have a couple of our girls, a part of my team that are also running the same half marathon and donating to that. So I'd just like to second um, the Black Women in Sports Foundation. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, next question. Now that you've graduated, how does the outside world compare to your experience at Harvard and how well did Harvard prepare for you to cope? So Joseph, we haven't heard from you in a while. What are you thinking? Yeah, um, I, I imagine, you know, some of the thought that went into that question may be that the world is not as forgiving <laughs> as, as Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, but what I will say, you know, throughout a lot of our lives, having gotten to a place as elite as Harvard, you know, we've all done the balancing act of navigating through predominantly white spaces. Um, so, I, I don't think it's dramatically different um, in, in terms of, you know, a lot of the, the attitudes that um, I've, I've had to navigate. Um, where I do think you do feel um, a bit of a distinction in terms of the culture of my workplace, for example, um, you know, versus the, the culture of Harvard broadly is, uh, you know, just how willing people are to have a discourse. Um, as you can imagine, like professional settings, like highly professional settings, um, often don't really lend themselves to difficult conversations. Um, and, you know, that at times can be challenging. And that's where, um, you know, a lot of the advice that we're talking, that we've talked about over the course of this discussion shifts from the personal to the, 
uh, systemic and you know infrastructure sort of related. Um, and that's where it becomes more important that you create more dynamic systems as opposed to hoping that you can connect with people on a, on a personal level because um, you know I can affect change you know in, by through having conversations with people that I work with directly but you know corporations um, you know if, if that's where your post-grad experience takes place um, just don't have the same soul and emotion that a college campus does have. Um, so I think that's where the fight just becomes a bit more strategic and oriented around around systems. Sorry, you're on mute. I was going to say, I keep forgetting I'm on mute. <laughs> My bad. Uh, anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I was going to talk about, because um, being in the beauty industry and now um, having my own brand in the beauty industry, um, it's something where you have a seat at the table or you don't have a seat at the table and you have a seat at the side table and you may not even be invited to the side table. Um, and so I think that's a big thing because you come from Harvard, you graduate and you, it's almost like you're at the top of the world or you're top of your game. And then you go to a land and a place and a world and a corporate world that's very different. And you have that intersection again of like, okay, I'm back to the to at the bottom of the totem pole. I'm a freshman, but then I have the intersection of being a black freshman, a black athlete freshman, a black, a black female athlete freshman um, in that respect. So I think, um, it's just, it's almost a rude awakening. Um, and it was a rude awakening for me personally, um, just going into the beauty industry. Um, but I do think um, with everything going on and how, um, how we've dealt with it, like changes are happening. But I think it's understanding that it's not gonna be like the same in the sense you're not welcomed, necessarily always welcomed onto your team. So, yeah. Okay. Um... So then next question is, how would you, the team, navigate approaching a coach that is not so vocal on diversity issues, Black Lives Matter, or at least just doing the bare minimum of support? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I can go ahead. I mean, uh, to be frank, I think you know, when I reflect on my college experience, I think I, I fell short of, um, you know, what I was capable of achieving in, in terms of moving the needle and um, being the starting point of conversations and ensuring that your coaches are doing enough as it relates to racial justice. Um, you know, I, I was a captain for two years. I was, you know, effectively a leader the entire time I was there and I had a great relationship with my coach. Um, but I think, you know, the dynamics of my team, um, having been the only voice, um, you know, that could identify with those types of issues, uh, I didn't feel very empowered, um, despite having a, a, you know, decently strong relationship. Um, but I will say, you know, in the wake of, uh, you know, everything that's happened over the past couple months, I had a very long conversation with my coach. Um, and a very transparent one. Um, and it started, you know, the same way that many of my points tonight have started, you know, just from the emotional element of things, um, from a, a place of empathy. And, um, you know, I think it was a very effective conversation, not only in terms of, you know, his understanding of what I've experienced, but also, um, you know, his willingness to, you know, take that extra step. Um, from an action standpoint, you know, and, and not just, uh, you know, having this feel good kumbaya moment. Um, so I think a lot of it really just comes down to that, that transparency. And um, if you do have the benefit of a coach that um, puts a tremendous amount of effort into building those relationships with, uh, you know, with his competitors or his or her competitors, um, you know, leverage that um, and understand that, you know, that's a part of yourself that you can't really neglect, um, you know, your racial identity and all of the uh, challenges that come with it. And when someone signs up to be your coach, um, you know, that's an element of your humanity that, um, you know, they're meant to nourish the same way that they, they nourish other parts of it. Um, so I, I think a lot of it's just that transparency and, and that openness. It, it's difficult to have those conversations, you know, when you haven't. Um, but again, you know, 
oftentimes these people are incredibly invested in you as a person and I'm sure Tracy can, can speak to this um, and, and just try to leverage that as, as a starting point. Yeah, I think it'd probably be pretty tough to navigate that as the as the athlete, right? That that, that power structure there. Um, but I'm a, I'm a firm believer that uh, leadership most of the time comes from the top. Um, so you know, the more you know, administrators, the, the more the, the leadership can create that environment um, that is diverse. You know, whether that's through hiring, you know, to have it, having a more diverse staff, more more diverse coaches, um, whether they're assistants, you know, like I said, administrators. I think it's going to trickle down. Um, I also believe if, if an administrator or an AD um, makes it at their agenda, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be hard for any school, right, um, to diversify the department, diversify teams, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Not just checking off a box, but truly believing that. And when that AD truly believes that, that trickles down to the staff, right? So if you're just checking off a box, hey, we have to diversify, diversify our staff, we have to add this person, add that person. Okay, those coaches who were kind of on the borderline that like this person described um, might not change. But if the AD truly uh, shows conviction behind uh, that mission, it trickles down immediately. So I, again, my firm believer in leadership and even on your team, you know, even on sports teams in general, if you have strong leaders on the team that can help uh, that situation as well. But again, I think come from the top. Okay. Thank you. And so in the, oh, go ahead, Chris. I don't want to cut yeah. you a deep no, thought. I, I was just going to say quickly on that point, Joe uh, Ghazi and I have been working on uh, a coalition for you know, student athletes uh, across the country, basically to talk about issues like these, particularly for black student athletes. And, you know, a few thoughts that came to mind with respect on how to have those tough conversations are, one, uh, to Tracy's point, you know, the administration creating uh, a culture where student athletes feel empowered to speak. Um, but second, I think the idea of community and the affinity networks that we've spoken about, I think having community emboldens people to be able to, you know, have a place where they can, one, have an outlet to, you know, confirm that, wait, I'm, am, I, am I sure that is actually a thing or maybe I'm overthinking it, but having people that you can kind of bounce those ideas off to affirm you. And then also people that you can have a conversation is like, how do I approach this discussion? What have you guys done with your team? Like, there needs to be a place where student athletes feel like they can, um, they can they can be empowered by their peers as well okay well in the interest of time i i want to thank everyone there's still some more questions in there that i'm hoping that uh, the varsity club can capture and that we can address but i want to thank all of my panelists tracy green Ghazi Musa, Joseph Johnson, and Chris Eggy. Uh, thank you so much for your insights, your willingness to share. Uh, I want to thank everyone that joined us this evening and again encourage you to uh, continue to participate in this series of discussions, but just as importantly, think about how you can turn that to action. So thank you again for your time. Everyone have a wonderful evening and uh, take care. <laughs>